Hey everyone! Hey guys! Welcome to Rooted in Time Genealogy with your hosts Nicole and Melody. We are two sisters creating a podcast that uses genealogy, history, and psychology intermixed with a smattering of generational trauma to bring to life a 4D view of our ancestors. Today we're continuing our Trauma Begits Trauma series by using genealogical records, newspaper articles, historical context, and oral interviews to take a deep look into Percy Wright, the son of Vasper and Annie Wright, and brother of Iris, Leo James, and George. We will animate the childhood of Percy Wright, our maternal grandfather. We would like to thank our mother and uncles for their help in better understanding our grandfather. As an addition, we will be including some snippets of an interview we had with them to gather further information and preserve our stories. Links to source material are available at rootedintime.net. You will find primary source documents, relevant newspaper articles, and images if available. A list of our services can be found there as well. Also, be sure to check out the blogs that you can find on the website that may have more detailed information if any of these topics interest you. So we do have some trigger warnings. Throughout the series, instances of family violence, emotional, mental, and physical abuse, incest, childhood abuse, neglect, self-harm, drug and alcohol abuse, and sexual assault will be discussed. So we completely understand if you are unable to finish this series. And if you are in a domestic violence situation, please call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 800-799-7233. You can also send a text with the word START to 88788. If you are in need of local mental health or domestic violence resources, you can always call 211 and receive assistance from the United Way. If you are in an emergency situation or having a mental health crisis, please dial 911. So those of you who have been on this road with us discussing our family history know that a lot of it is laced with a lot of trauma. This is going to be no different and I would argue potentially even worse in some ways than our previous podcast. Percy was my mom's dad and he was born to Vasper and Annie Wright on the 29th of July, 1932 in Mercer County, West Virginia. His dad, Vasper, was a coal miner, and we talk about him on a prior uh, podcast. Once the Great Depression hit, coal prices also plummeted at the same time, so all these impacts ultimately caused Vasper to have to declare bankruptcy, and we see that in a newspaper article from 1931. So Percy is born in a year later, in 32, to a father and family who already had to declare bankruptcy. Yeah. It doesn't look like it's going to be a great start for him at all. Yeah, absolutely. And so whenever you think of just that, whenever he's being formed, being developed, when his even poverty impacts a mom who's carrying the baby. I would think nutrition. Yeah, exactly. Nutrition, vitamins. I don't really know exactly where everything stood with, you know, um, prenatal vitamins at that time. Yeah. Not really sure about that. But either way, you're probably not getting the nutrients that you want. You are most likely not going to the doctor and making sure everything's going as well as it should be going like you would. I doubt they're going to the doctor very often at all. No, I doubt it. And so it's very different than like the mindset that you would think of today in terms of that because there's also... I know if you are low income today, there are programs that are... A little bit later, because the Great Depression does uh, have New Deal reforms that does put in a few more programs, but in 32, the only programming you would have would be at the local level. Yeah. So if your local level was poor, you're screwed. There's really not much. A lot of the churches would try to help, and you'd have local charities, but outside of that, you're not really getting much in the way of state assistance Mm -hmm. at this point. And that's even before he's physically born. Yes. <laughs> like, like, so already he doesn't have the same type of nutrients, type of development that you would hope any child would get. And so there is a thing that is known as failure to thrive. I wouldn't be surprised if that were to happen to uh, more children that are in, within the poverty realm. 
Yeah. Um, just because of those basic necessities that a mom needs during that crucial time of development for their baby. After, if you're dealing with that while you're pregnant, after they're born, their forefront is probably trying, I would imagine anyways, just on survival mode. Trying to make it day by day, trying to even just get food on the table. And with the bankruptcy that you see that Vasper had to do, obviously they weren't really prevailing with being able to do so. And poverty can have so many impacts on children, especially during the first few years of their life where it's so much going on in terms of development for them. You're setting a baseline for the rest of their life. Yeah, well, and to give you an idea of how bad it probably was for him to declare bankruptcy, the U.S. Senate Committee on Interstate Commerce published a report in 1936 that said the average coal loader in 1929 made about $1,200 a year. (laughs) But by 1933, so right after he was born, it had dropped all the way down to about $557 a year. So what would that look like in like our t- today's society? It would still definitely be below the poverty line. Because mm-hmm. you're looking at a little more than a dollar a day, which even back then would not have amounted to enough to sustain a family as large as he had. He already had yeah. three kids. Yeah. So, uh, and then plus him and his wife, they're literally kind of sitting at below subsistence level Mm -hmm. in need of resources that today, yes, you can generally find, but there's still not great resources even today to help with all the situations with that people have in poverty, especially children in poverty. Yeah. Oh, I have to tell this story. uh (laughs) Uh-oh. So, (laughs) I once went to a doctor in Texas, and this mentality just kind of, this- Was was this a doctor I know, like, that we had both gone to? No, no. Oh, no, okay. this was a doctor. So I went to that doctor. It was a female doctor. So I was mm-hmm. getting, you know, the yearly, right? And she made a comment about school lunches and how they should not be helping children have school lunches because the parents, if they can't pay for it, oh, well, for the kids. What? This was a doctor who had a degree and I was flabbergasted why it came up i can't remember yeah i was about to ask i was like why was it this even wasn't something that me was because that i really... wouldn't have like brought anything like that up just off you know but i remember it was it wasn't until that point and i was in my 20s where i was sitting back and going oh so there really are people who feel like children in poverty should not be assisted yeah because of their parents choices Yeah, that's a very very egocentric kind of mentality. And you're not doing anybody any favors by not helping. Because here's the thing. Like, kids don't, people don't choose poverty. Nobody goes into life being like, hey, I really hope one day I am not able to feed my family or provide for myself. No. There's circumstances surrounding, it could possibly be some choices, but some that are outside of their control. Mo- a lot of people who are in poverty, it's a generational thing. It mm-hmm. wasn't just they ended up there. No, a lot of times if you look at their their history and you go back, it just was part of the culture of that family, which is unfortunate. And then the thing is, it's hard to get out of it because resources are limited, especially at this time. Yeah. You figure if you are living in poverty, you are surrounded by a network of people who also are living in poverty, which means that you are most likely at a school that doesn't have resources that a more affluent com- uh, affluent area would have. So therefore, you're not getting the same type of benefits that other kids are getting that are able to propel them forward and let them thrive. Well, and children, those that go to school with an empty stomach and don't have the right carbohydrates and the right nutrition are going to automatically pretty much be 10 rungs down where they could be. Absolutely. Because you need that in order, one, feel secure. 
So these kids are growing up without that security. Thank God I'm in a position where Alex never has to worry about what she's going to eat. Yeah. You know, um, she doesn't have that. That's not something that any child should really have to worry about. But the reality is there are kids who do. Oh, yeah. And so for, and it's just a doctor, somebody who vow is to not do harm, right? Yep. Do no harm. Do no harm. And not to mention somebody who works with moms. And children that are developing. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. No. That's not okay. I'm floored by one. Why keep them to yourself. If you have this in that situation, yeah, keep them to yourself. Agreed. Like, I would be just my. I don't know. Well, I'm already kind of just like. Think about it. I've had tons of doctor's appointments in in my whole life, but that is one of a slight handful that stick out in my mind because of what was said. Yeah, I mean, I have. a a doctor that I can think of where it just sticks out of my mind because of something he said that was stupid, but it wasn't along those lines. It had nothing to do with anything of this nature. Yeah. But I would really hope that that would be very few and far between. Yeah. And and what we're kind of showing here is that mentality at this point is not gone um, at all. Yeah. That there are still people that would say if the parents don't make enough money, oh, well, their children just kind of fall in that. And we have, this mentality of social Darwinism, which mm-hmm. if you want to have social Darwinism and you're going to look at yourself as an entire society, you would think society would try to step up to make the cause for everyone better. But yeah. that's not always the case. But the U.S. is so interesting in regards to some people's relationship with how they should help others, right? Yeah, it is. we very are very diverse. self-made man. You know, Capitalism. yeah, and it's just the, the bottom line is I don't believe that we're meant to do anything on our own. Like you, you should know, help people if you have the capacity to being able to. Humans are social creatures. Yeah. Absolutely. So even the most introverted person in the world, and I'm pretty close to that, but yeah. even the most introverted person in the world needs society in order to fully realize themselves and to have a good life yeah so yeah well and i don't know you know you use all those like sports thing you're no better than you know the worst player on your team right yep like so the goal of whenever you're on a team is to make sure that everybody is doing their part and lifting that person who may be struggling a bit up to make your entire team be stronger same rules should apply with society. Yep, yep. I wanted to get a little bit more into what his childhood looked like mm-hmm. as far as him. Now, we know he is poverty level. He's not getting what he needs, much less wants. Yeah, and both the biological and psychological. Yes. So his mom, Annie... According to our Uncle Rick in that interview, he didn't really ever talk about his mother. Now, his mother did die in 1946, so he was still, you know, kind of young, but old enough to have remembered her if there was anything positive to say, but it was almost like she was a non-entity in his life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was how it felt, like that there was just nothing when it came to his mom. Mm -hmm. Now, with his dad, he was... From what we understand with the interview, he was quite angry with his dad, at least when he was younger. And I mean, you'll know why. He ends up ultimately, because of the poverty and his parents' inability to care for him and his siblings, his siblings were pulled away and taken Mm -hmm. out of the home. His sister was placed with family, but the two boys were placed in a poor farm. Yeah. You know, I had never really heard of poor farms growing up but it is something that was across the united states from the latter 1800s and some of them were still there up until the 60s -hmm. so poor farms were in a transition at the time when they were put in it from being completely like locally run and you know monies mostly coming from the local government to now coming more from a state 
level because with the Great Depression, you had those reforms that came through. What they saw in Mercer County is this is like the first poor farm where they wanted to take away the dormitory style living and put independent cabins out for independent living. And I think that was a good strategy. Yeah. Problem is, there's still too many people needing help and assistance in the area to be supported by those cabins. Yeah. So they're still going to have to utilize dormitory style living in certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. So the 1940 census, this is where I found out That he was at the County Farm Institute for the Needy. That's what they called theirs, Mercer County Poor Farm. Both him and his brother, so Percy and Leo, were both at the poor farm together. His parents were not there. Iris was not there. George was not there. He had been adopted out. He was the youngest, so he was probably closer to that age that people were like, oh, I'll adopt. You know, these kids are older. Guess what they're listed as in the poor farm? What? Inmates. Huh. So already you're giving those children, like, a huge stigma. Yeah. They're already listed as an inmate with where they live, which is almost like a lesser than sort of thing. Yeah, it is. Um, It's a very poor choice word to use for kids who didn't make any choices, didn't do anything to warrant going there. It was outside situations and conditions that made it to where they had to go there so yeah that's a that's ridiculous <laughs> Mm-mm. i will say that with them in their poor farm um the burden of care prior to the 1920s was at a local burden aka county well so like if you're in Louisiana, it might have been a parish level, but most of the people call it a county. And every county had their own overseer okay. in place, meaning that the person that was looking over a lot of the poor farms or different agencies wasn't going to be very successful statewide because it was all dependent upon the county. And if one county wanted to do great things and the county next to it wasn't willing to help reciprocate that that could lead to pretty much them being the weakest denominator huh okay and then 1920s is when they finally started to increase the state funding and that's when they made welfare boards so it wasn't just one overseer in a county making all these decisions the problem is the reason why this didn't get kick-started so well is because that started in the 20s, and then the 30s, you have the Great Depression. Yeah. So they get swamped with a lot more individuals. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever heard me ask this, but what makes a Great Depression great? Um, I don't know. <laughs> it hits your pocketbook. Gotcha. So there were a lot of people during the Great Depression that were not impacted. Mm-hmm. There were a lot that were marginally impacted. They were above subsistence, and they're, like, above subsistence, but they're not going to be able to go out and do, like, extra things. Yeah. But there were still an overwhelming number of individuals that needed help. And the two areas that I will say state funding did focus on primarily were children and veterans. Hmm. Which is no different than what you hear for certain arguments today. Percy did make a comment to Uncle Rick about the fact that he wouldn't stay at his orphanages very long. (laughs) And out of orphanages. And I don't know if that meant because he was in trouble and he'd get replaced elsewhere, you know, in and out. Because there were orphanages as well. But it sounds like he went through many iterations and that some of the places he stayed were not that great. There was a lot of physical violence and things that he was seeing at that level, which is still a problem with, you know, foster care and group Mm -hmm. homes and all that today. Yep. I I wonder how many different orphanages, because the, just the psychological ramifications of being pulled from your home, happening to go to this new foreign place, with all these other personalities that you don't know, um, 
that in itself is trauma. Very traumatizing. He is eight years old. Yeah. Like, that's the same age as Alex, my daughter. And it's just, even as an adult, going into something like that, I wouldn't really know what to do. Having a kid who's just been already through a lot with dealing with his father who was abusive. Um, yeah. His mom who wasn't stable. And then being thrust into this kind of place, it's just, it doesn't surprise me he didn't thrive in life. No, not at all. These cards were terrible that he was dealt. It's unfortunate. Nowadays, we still we still see, you know, kids being placed in, obviously they're not going to call them poor farms anymore. Yeah. But in group homes. Group homes. Um, which are supposed to be therapeutic, but mm. they aren't always therapeutic, as I can contest having worked with some group homes in the past that they don't always do all the things that they're supposed to do or even claim to do. And, you know, in these poor farms, they were the, what they were trying to do was use work as a means to get them out of their situation. So the kids, while they would go to school, they spent more time working Mm -hmm. than they did in school on these farms, on many of these farms. Free labor. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. Do you know how far he went in school? Sixth, seventh grade, eighth grade. So not definitely probably know. not past middle school. No. Uh-huh. Yeah. And there's nothing the kids can do about it because they're placed there and they have to stay there. And the kids, I mean, I'm picturing like an eight year old going and doing hard labor. Yeah. And that being their primary thing. They don't get a childhood. Childhood no. is gone. And I wonder how well those schools were. My guess is not very. So I did read a few articles that talked about how they were trying to get buses and better schooling in this area so that people from the farm could get to school. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing they were still struggling with the whole schooling aspect. Um, It was not a priority. It was not financially a priority. It was not... I think even psychologically a priority at that point. Now, and with Percy being moved from different orphanages to different orphanages, then I'm guessing Leo wasn't moved with him all the time either. Probably not. So, they were probably in and yeah. out, which I don't know if that was a bad thing because when we get to Leo. Yeah, he's a he's an interesting guy. He uh, He's like conduct disorder meets antisocial personality <laughs> disorder uh yeah he he definitely had some aggressive anger that poor mania f- type of things going on we'll call it that poor farm to prison pipeline that yeah. um is looking he like it's happening definitely here definitely tracking for that no. and then in 46 he doesn't have a mom because she passes away his dad the year later is put in prison. He's already in jail at that point, yeah. but he's put in prison for incest with his sister. So I'm sure that didn't go over well with people in the town and the community. And I'm sure people oh, are no. opening their mouths mm-hmm. about stuff. Now, it's interesting that our uncles and mom and told us that Percy never talked of a sister. Yeah. So I'm wondering well, if he just had that much animosity and blamed her for Vasper ending up in prison. Yeah, it makes me wonder, too. It also is just, like, one of those, you know, family secrets that people don't talk about because, one, there is shame with that, you know, that people would have. Even on today's society, you know, in today's terms. Oh, yeah. You wouldn't want people to know that about your your family, that that happened. So it doesn't really surprise me that it was very hush-hush. It kind of surprises me, though, that Percy ended up actually going and seeing Vasper later in life, though. Like, yeah. I'm a little confused by that. I don't think I would. <laughs> See, and I think the only way that, that I would have been able to circumvent in my mind to do that would be if I blamed it on Iris 
yeah. rather than on my father. Yeah, and I, I don't know, or or he just didn't believe that it happened. Yeah. You know, and just completely well, yeah. do the denial of it all. Like, no, that never happened, and so I'm just going to push it aside. After he had a family and the kids were born, they said they went and saw Vasper probably mm. like three times. So it wasn't, and it was a trek. If you're going from either California, Ohio, or Michigan over to West Virginia, I mean, that's a trek. <laughs> so how old would have Percy been whenever he went to jail for the Iris? You mean Vasper? Vasper. Oh, yeah. no. How old would Percy be when Vasper Percy. went to jail? Yeah. He was born in 32. That was in 47. So 15? Okay, so I old guess. enough to where he would have understood. Oh, he knew, yeah. He could yeah. fully comprehend what was going on by that point in time. Yeah, because I was like, if he was itty-bitty or something like that, then maybe, like, everybody was hush-hush and he didn't wasn't really aware. No. Well, on. and, I mean, so. he stayed a lot with Leo, who was older yeah. than him. I'm pretty sure those two spoke to each other if they're placed together. Yeah. <laughs> At least more so than anyone else in his family. Yeah. So, I mean, at the time when he was younger, he was not, he was mad about being forced into these different places. Now, whether his response was, I want, this is all the state doing this to me. I want to go live with my dad. They keep telling me no. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, it's his fault. I'm, do either way, it's just going to cause a lot of animosity and anger to build up, especially a 15 year old boy. Yeah. I mean, it's not surprising. Well, and the thing is, like, there are studies that question what's best for a child whenever it comes to being taken from a family. And some of them, depending on the situation, obviously, if a child's life is in danger, staying at a home, they need to be removed. Yeah. You know, it's just plain and simple. Um, but whenever it's a situation where it's like, not great but not absolutely horrible mm -hmm. they are kind of juggling what's best for the kid because the trauma of being pulled from the kid can have a deep impact in them. well um, and even with a removal if you remove yeah. a kid the idea or the the goal in the end to this day is reunification yeah so we nobody wants to pull a child from their situation and their environment and i'm pretty sure that would hold true back then as well but we're in this kind of battleground where it's very reunification and mm -hmm. i think at some point we'll end up in a middle ground yeah where it's really going to be about what's the safety and best for the child rather than trying to get our numbers up to show that this is this, this, and this, they did this, so therefore they're drug-free now, let's give the kid back, and then, you know, you have yeah. problems within the year. So I'm going to read a part of a study, and I'll send this study over to you. Um, okay. It's a Marquee Law Review, and it says in here when children are removed from their families often suddenly and without warning and transferred to a new family environment children have a harmful physiological response rooted in stress and far too often are traumatized while discussing their involvement in the apprehension transaction so whenever a child is forcefully removed children report experiences of ambiguity loss and trauma and often equate child remover removal to kidnapping yep and so and it goes on and says that the children's report suggests that the apprehension transaction is often interpreted as a threat to their well-being and an event that should be avoided if at all possible and that that's this was done i believe in 2019 i believe is whenever this study was done and so you wonder, because I've heard of stories in today's reports how children are removed. It's not always the most sensitive way of doing it. Nope. But typically, you do have a social worker and stuff called. But back then? But social workers can't do the removal. It has to be law enforcement. Now, some places that have enough social workers would do that. 
But if they don't, it's up to law enforcement, who is... I, I talked to one officer in South Carolina and asked, you know, how many days of training were spent on dealing with, mm-hmm. you know, youth, just in general. They said about a day and a half. Yeah, that's enough. So that that tell that's that's where the focus you you can see where the focus is. Yeah. It's not there. So then I mean it's just kind of a slippery slope after that because then you have an officer too who's forcibly removing the kid. And I wonder how that would make that child feel about police officers and things like that, you know, in general too. Because I I just think about Percy's mindset with police officers was not good. Yeah. No, he hated them. There, that's a that's a lot. Well, his older brother also, if you think about siblings, you think about, you know, the younger brother normally trying to look up to the older brother. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what we knew about Leo during this period of time, like the transitional time between like 1940 and 1945, when all this chaos is going on in mm-hmm. Percy's life. On December 2nd, 1945, Leo turns 18 years old. Which means any services that he would have had access to, he was pretty Mm -hmm. much cut off because there wasn't this idea. Like now, if you have services because you're pulled out, you can have different things up until like 21 or 24 or something like Mm that, depending on where you're at. Um, You can also get help with college and things like that. They are just pretty much kicked to the curb when they're out of the system and said, go deal with life. So he ended up back with Vasper. Huh. Okay. Because we know this because in his testimony on the Iris court case, he said he was staying with them at the same time when Iris said that something happened. Okay. So we know Leo was actually there and probably had left prior to him turning 18, which he could have lied about his age or maybe age out was 17. Or I, I would have to look it up, but it's just, we know he ends up back with Vasper and his mom because she at that point would have still been alive granted she was probably at the state hospital by then okay so because she was in the Huntington State Hospital for more than likely mental health reasons but she also had epilepsy okay which at the time could have been viewed as that as well Mm -hmm. one of the first things he does is he goes on a crime spree with two friends of course in 1946, so, you know, he's a newly 18-year-old. They're originally charged with stealing three vehicles Jeez. Um, in the Rodell area, which was where Vasper was being held. Okay. Ultimately, he got a plea bargain. He uh, got, got it for stealing one car. He did have to go to jail because he already had a <laughs> grand larceny charge that he had to sit there for. Then just a few months later in November, so July to November of 46, he decided to pick up some more charges, you know, because that's what Mm -hmm. you do. So he got charged three times with trespassing. Okay. One time with grand larceny Hmm. and, surprise, surprise, auto theft. Really likes those cars. He likes those cars. Hmm. And then I'm looking through the newspapers. I'm like, oh, gosh. Did Leo do anything else while he was young? (laughs) And there was this article, Leo Wright jailed in Wyoming, which is in West Virginia, also wanted in Mercer and Raleigh. Hmm. I'm like, oh, okay, what did he do? He's just doing his thing, man. he, (laughs) he, um, He ultimately ended up on probation as the response to the earlier thing in November. Okay. But he never showed up to probation. Okay. So at this point, he's 21 years old, doesn't show up to probation, and now is trying to get uh, out of having another charge for auto theft. Yeah. Hmm. Cars. So it, gets, it gets better. Oh, it gets I bet better. it does. So, so in 1949, okay. he is in the Wyoming County Jail. And he escapes police custody. He was on the way to the penitentiary. And him and this other guy decided to overthrow the guard, steal the car. (laughs) So they're escaping. They got all the way to Illinois before being caught. But in that time, they 
they had to go that extra mile and get some new charges as well. Oh, okay. So they're now charged in different jurisdictions with stealing three cars mm-hmm. and robbing two establishments. You would think their primary thing would be getting someplace and hiding. Like, it kind of like a YOLO, just just keep going, just you might as well. I think they were just joyriding it out. I mean, yeah, the headline for that was, Police believe escaped fugitives traveling in stolen automobile. So those two, yeah. They went out for a while. Um, and by the way, when they overtook the uh, the officer, it was not good. It, it That was another charge in and of itself. Yeah. You can't assault a police officer or a guard. What I found really interesting is Leo actually responded in a way that made sense to me. Hmm. Like the overtly disruptive. And that could be because of my previous occupation. But I was kind of like, okay, this makes sense. Percy, actually, I did not see at least a newspaper article, so he didn't get to that degree, um, of him committing any crimes until yeah. 1953, which was for gambling. It, I mean, it wasn't a violent off. It wasn't anything that was violent or... Yeah. Hmm. That is interesting, like, because yes. where he ends up going... And maybe he had juvenile charges or he had... But if he had any big crimes, I mean, this newspaper was really good about reporting on Leo. You would think they would, you know, report on him. Yeah. Well, it sounded like Leo had a, was a bit of a klepto. Yeah. Well, he liked his cars. And so his impulsivity control was obviously very low. Not, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not great decision-making skills there. So I think Percy definitely struggled in his own ways with everything. But I think it was more of an internal kind of struggle instead of outwardly behavioral. A lot of alcohol. Um, Yeah. And then once the alcohol and stuff like that kind of took, uh, started playing a role in his life, that's typically whenever you would start seeing things or the stories would come into play about his um, anger would come out. And so it sounds like Leo, that was just kind of what he did. Well, and the interesting thing with Percy is that one thing he does that Leo did not do right away was he Mm -hmm. actually found a partner to get married to. How did y'all's parents meet? Uh, you know, that is a good question. I really never asked mom how they met. Around the area she lived, um, on a repeated basis, but she, I, she said that he was the most gorgeous guy around. Mom told me that um, she married dad because at such a young age because she just wanted to get out of the house because. You know, Grandma was an alcoholic, and she was raising um, Ginger and Uncle Mick. So it was her out. Yeah, it was her way to get out. It was the same thing for uh, Aunt Sonny. I mean, Aunt Sonny was 14 years old and got married because it it was just like they lived in a house that had uh, a floor that you could see underneath the house that had chickens running around underneath the house. So, And they lived in the hollers. So any way they could get out back then, the girls would get married early. Yeah. Yeah. They, they just thought they could have a better life someplace. And most of them married alcoholics and stuff. Uh, Aunt Sonny got, did good. She married a good Christian man. The date of his marriage was June 14th, 1952. He was 20 years old. Guess how old his partner was? How old? She was 16. Oh, no. His wife, Helen, they had to go to Tennessee to elope where Helen then lied to the court and said, I'm 18. And she has, in fact, said that's what she did. She lied <laughs> to yeah, the court. she lied. She's, she's like, yeah, I lied. I lied. I wanted away from my circumstance. Um, yeah. And they got married. Then a year later, in May of 1953, a month before his first son is to be born, he enlists in the military. 
Okay. Now, we don't know if this enlistment was a draft or if he actually chose to enlist, but the story he gave Uncle Rick was that he enlisted at 16 because he wanted to get away from everything in the military, but we know by 1953... He was 21 years old. He could have went in the military in 1950 when the Korean War started. Yeah. You didn't get, you didn't enlist. They, they told you oh. to go in. So, yeah. Draft. Um, yeah. Draft. But he, I think he knew he was going to get drafted because he, he did it a, a year ahead of time and lied about mm-hmm. it. But you got to remember back then, there was no money. He worked in a coal mine. And from what I understand, he made, if I'm not mistaken, a uh, dollar an hour working in a coal mine. And, he he would make more money in the military and knew mom would be taken care of better if he was in the military. Yeah, well, it would have to be, it would have to be enlisted, because he did it at sixteen. They could not come after him until he was uh, seventeen. Eighteen. So, oh, seventeen. Okay. And it's actually eighteen because if you were in, still in school, if you got out of school, then I guess it's a different story. Okay. So. I don't know if I believe the whole. Um, I think it might have just been a way of making it seem like cooler, maybe, if you will. Like I could totally see our dad saying something. Oh like that. yeah, I'm sure he did say stuff like that. Like he yeah, got every I mean, single answer right on the Air Force exam, and they really wanted him in the Air Force, but he decided he didn't want to go. What? Yeah, that's what did he really? That's say what it? he told me. <laughs> <laughs> he never said that to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, just I thought that was common knowledge. That. <laughs> no, no, not at all. But I mean, I could see him saying something like that to you because your talent was one of your talents was very like books. Um, scholarly books. And so it was a way to make himself seem like I'm just as smart as you are. Yeah, he never I was. did this. <laughs> or hey, you know, you got your smarts from me. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> Because that was also his M.O. <laughs> Nothing was ours. Everything was his. Um. He didn't really talk about his military um, stuff at all. So what, that's okay. what I gathered out of the interview. Like, they're like, we, he said he entered at, besides the story of his entering, you know, and choosing to enter, he stayed in for the two years. And at that time, the draft was a two-year draft. So it makes sense to me that it would have been a two-year term yeah and so in case people are wondering how to get that information what do you have to do like if you want to find out like military type stuff well i use fold three for some of it and ancestry just to see you know what the normal database is but if you want to go through the actual veterans office and you can request records the problem is a lot of the records during this period of time were destroyed in a fire. Hmm. So, and I'm okay. talking like 70%. Oh, wow. So, obviously, this is going to be prior to computers and all that. So, a lot of what you're going to get is going to be stuff that would have been held off site that they may or may not have reclaimed access to. Um, but if, some people get lucky and they're all of the stuff's there because you have that 30 percent that can still retrieve the information okay yep hmm. interesting it's just i don't know that's so weird to me that he would lie like why lie about that because that's something later on you could just look up for some people they would think to look it up but if you're telling that to one of your kids you're not going to think that they're going to not believe i mean you and i look figured it out that you know? i was created out of wedlock when i was able to do math so you i don't uh-huh. know i just think people i don't know i think sometimes first but that's also you i'm not good at math you know i'm just <laughs> no but you are good at yeah. questioning anything somebody says to you the proof. <laughs> especially from <Yeah>. him <laughs> like it was just something that I feel like is something within you that you just you like to research you like to look into things and he also has such a huge distrust of our dad (laughs) that 
And also, I feel like you were really trying to find proof that he was. wasn't your dad. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> it's an unfortunate thing to realize you can't yeah. disprove that part. <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, before we end on like his younger life, because we, re- I really want to get into in the next podcast on his family life. And the family life and what happened during that point in time. And it's going to build up to the culmination of an incident that has left the next generation part of that generational trauma um, on, like, I would say a more extreme end. It's not something that is very common. Yeah, it was. No, it's not something that's common, and there's so many questions surrounding it yeah. still to this day. And it's also something that, as we dive into it, we have questions, too. Yes. Um, and that's something, we don't know if this is going to end up being a two-parter or three-parter. We're just going to see how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and see if we can include that information on the next part or if it needs to be its own piece of information. But either way, there will be very specific documentation in the blog that I will do on this and on like the resources for the podcast. So you're going to be able to see, yeah. I'm, I'm probably going to put everything, like all the articles, not just like a sampling. I'll probably put all the articles the timeline, the everything up there, especially if somebody might live in the area and might know something, it'd be very interesting to hear from you uh, what was said or what mm-hmm. you remember, just because Absolutely. it's, it's kind of crazy what happens, um, especially as I read through more and more information. And I'm also carrying the lens of how law enforcement should work now and I am trying to, you know, understand that this wasn't, this was in the 70s, It was, but still, there's still things that don't make sense to me, even looking at it from the scope of the 70s. So Absolutely. Um, two mm-hmm. of the things we're really going to be looking at impacting uh, Percy and his, his life later, a lot of it's going to be alcohol-driven. Well, I'll tell you, he, uh, he has split personality. When dad wasn't drinking, he was the nicest guy. He worked on everybody's cars for him. He took care of things. He worked on their houses. He just took care of things. And he was just a nice guy when he wasn't drinking. So yeah. he gets his like first drunk driving charge in 56. And that won't be the last. He'll get numerous drunk driving charges. Um, so <laughs> we know the alcohol. And then there's going to be another story we're going to tell about medications that we're going to have but also the snippets throughout this hopefully it gave you a better feel for what the next generation because those are the kids of percy speaking to you about what they felt and what they recollected yeah and one of them is our mom so who's a wonderful person so it's it's and crazy to uncles, think of what she went through. Yeah, they're her, okay too. Yeah, our uncles are pretty cool too. <laughs> so throw so that they out are, there. They, they can stay. I'm very biased against my mom. <laughs> <laughs> so. Alrighty. So until next time, be, be human. human.